Hi, everyone. Welcome to episode 143 of the Civil Engineering Podcast. This is the first podcast that's dedicated to helping civil engineers around the world succeed both professionally and personally. Uh, and excited to be here with you today uh, and, and bringing on board onto the Civil Engineering Conversation, uh, Will Buckby, who is a uh, contracts and uh, projects lawyer with Beale & Co. out of the UK. Uh, and he's going to be talking with us about COVID-19 and the impact that that's having on the construction and uh, engineering consultancy industries and, uh, and what you need to be doing as a project professional uh, to make sure that uh, the contracts that you are involved in and the projects that your company are going to be involved in are uh, fit for purpose and that everything is moving along uh, according to whatever the current uh, situation and plans may be that are in place across the industry in, in, as we uh, respond to COVID-19. We'll also be unpacking in the conversation, which I think is very useful, uh, some, some things to be thinking about, uh, both with regards to contracts that you may have already underway or in flight, but what you need to be thinking about in, uh, in, in either the proposals that you're putting together or contracts that you may be, uh, may be uh, becoming involved with uh, in, the, in the months and probably years ahead uh, as we move forward. And there's some really good conversation and some great, uh, three great points that, that Will makes specifically around uh, the issue of force majeure in contracts, which many of you uh, have heard that term before. Will unpacks it for us in this episode and also gives some really great takeaways that all of us need to be thinking about, not just our counsel within our firms, but each of us, again, as, as project professionals. Uh, so who am I? Well, as a reminder, I'm, uh, I'm Chris Knudsen. I'm a project professional, uh, a chartered and professional engineer and program uh, manager with about 27 years of experience in the, in the uh, AEC industry, a lot of it in the defense infrastructure, uh, and I'm coming to you from the United Kingdom. Uh, so a little bit about Will. I think it's uh, always useful to understand who we're going to be talking with today. And uh, Will is a contracts and advisory lawyer. He specializes in development construction and engineering matters, particularly, uh, well, here in the UK, but also Middle East and Africa. Highly experienced in advising on standard form contracts that include FIDIC and EDF, uh, as well as bespoke construction contracts, professional appointments, uh, collateral warranties, and a number of other uh, aspects related to, uh, to uh, project consultancy and construction. Um, he's been involved in a lot of major uh, construction projects, both here in the UK as well as around the world. Um, some of the ones that may be more notable uh, that, that many of you have heard of it would have been the uh, Crossrail uh, here in the UK, which is one of Europe's largest transportation uh, projects still ongoing. He was involved in the uh, in the uh, some of the procurement strategies for the Shard in London, involved in some major oil and gas projects down in the Middle East. Uh, as well as uh, transportation projects and uh, other facility works down in Africa. Um, so Will's, uh, he has a monthly section in the LexisNexis Construction Law Journal and is a regular speaker on, uh, on matters related to um, the procurement law and professional services in the engineering and construction arenas. So really excited to have Will on here. I think you're gonna, you're gonna listen to this uh, episode come away with a lot of key things to be thinking about, especially in this new, uh, new world that we're living in. So without further ado, Let's get with uh, Will Buckby and get right into today's civil engineering conversation. All right, everyone, now it's time for our civil engineering conversation, and I'm here with Will. Will, welcome to the Civil Engineering Podcast. How are you today? I'm well, thank you. Good morning. Yeah, yeah, it's great to be here. Uh, we're, both of us are, are coming, coming to all of you from, uh, from the UK, where uh, today, as I look out my window, it's nice and sunny. Um, so uh, despite the fact that our, our conversation today is going to be around a, a bit of a dark cloud that's descended around the, uh, around the planet, uh, we at least here today have some sun in the sky to, to bring a little bit of, little bit of joy. Uh, and in today's conversation, we're going to be talking about the, uh, the topic um, that is, that is uh, front and foremost on a lot of the minds, probably every mind, uh, of any professional who's involved in the architectural engineering construction industry, and that's COVID-19 and the impacts that that's going to have on, uh, on their, their business and their way of life. And, um, well, I'm glad that we were able to get you on to the show. I had an opportunity to attend one of your uh, webinars uh, here just recently about COVID-19 response in the engineering and construction industry. And that was the reason why I really wanted to get you on the show because I felt that that was uh, really good information that was gonna be useful for, for all of our listeners. So let's just jump into this because I think um, this okay. is certainly something that's really hitting a lot of the, uh, lot of the uh, engineering, architectural engineering consultants in the, in the construction industry. 
And I'd like to hear, see if you could just maybe give us a kind of a high level overview of what this impact is that COVID-19 is having on the construction market uh, overall. Yeah, well, well, cl well clearly the COVID-19 is having a, a significant impact on all walks of life, but um, construction, construction in particular. Um, just looking at, at the UK, consultants, professionals are now working, working from home and asking the big question, should, should we, can we go on site? Should we, should we be going on site and fulfilling our duties? Um, will our services continue? Will we continue with our supervision services? Will we continue with our design duties? What, what, what's going to happen? going to happen with our projects. Um, I, I think when COVID-19 initially uh, properly arrived yeah, here in the, in the UK, I think there was a huge amount of uncertainty as to what, what, the, current, what the current position is. On the 23rd of, of March, Boris Johnson, Prime Minister, um, put us all, as you know, on, on lockdown. And um, there, there was a big question as to as to what that means for for the con construction sector. Um, he effectively introduced um, only essential travel um, for, uh, for for key workers. So a ban on a ban on anything else. So the the big question to the construction sector is what does that mean for us? Um, will sites stay open? Will construction projects continue? Yeah. And, and it wasn't until, um, I think, the next day um, that the housing minister um, issued a tweet, um, a, a typical way of, of, of communicating yeah, right. government policy <laughs> these days, to yeah. say that construction sites can continue and, and, and should continue. Um, and so following that, um, yeah, contractors and employers have um, taken a step back and, and, and I think now are in a much better position to, uh, to assess what has happened and to decide whether, whether sites remain open. Um, you know, MACE yeah, in particular, and I mentioned them because they've, they've been quite vocal um, in the public uh, in relation to how, how they are going to approach this, suspended um, all projects initially in order to assess uh, assess the, the, the current position. Um, ISG, a uh, big, big contractor here in the UK, announced that it was suspending all, all, all construction projects. And, and I think since then, we, we, the industry, have looked at health and safety and whether construction projects can continue. Yeah. Health and safety is, of course, paramount. Yep. E every employer must, must ensure the health and safety of, of, of their staff, of their supply chain, of the individuals they, they work with as well. And, and, and following, following that assessment, following an assessment of the impact of, of COVID-19, I, I think the current position is some construction projects are continuing and some are on hold. And the test should be, and this is very important. If you as an employer, either the, the owner of the project, the contractor, the consultant, if you can guarantee the health and safety and well-being of your staff, your supply chain, and those with who you work with, then you can continue working. However, if you can't, then I think the industry's position, and certainly yeah, my advice as a legal advisor to, to our clients is that, that you, should, you should not work and that projects, projects should be put on hold or assessed as to how, how projects and work can continue safely. There's been a fair amount of industry guidance on this. The, the Construction Leadership Council has issued three versions of site operating procedures, dealing with the likes of social distancing, hygiene, site meetings, and how contractors, consultants should, should operate. Uh, we're also saying if you can't comply with that guidance, 
then you should also seriously consider whether you should continue working on site. Okay. And, and Will, is it, I mean, in general, you know, most in the, in the industry understand what, um, you know, the basics of what that, of what safe safety looks like from a health and safety standpoint. It, with, with these directives that are coming out, is it, is it generally understood what a, in, what a COVID-19 safe job site is going to look like? Um, and, you know, obviously there's construction sites and then we yes. have office operations as well with a lot mm. of, you know, engineering design consultancies um, that have now been, have been put into, into a, you know, a different working environment. So I'd be curious to hear your thoughts from a, really from a legal yeah. advisory standpoint of what constitutes, if I'm running a company, what constitutes a safe job site um, for, yeah. for my operations? So I think it's important to distinguish between um, the professionals, the engineers, the architects, and, and, and site, site work. Because clearly, you know, like yourself, like me, I, we can work. Um, to a large extent f from home and technology it has, has, has made that, that considerably, considerably easier. And, and I think the majority of, if not all um, consultants um, are, are, are not traveling to work, are working from home. Sure. Um, and and um, yeah, that is the right thing to do as, a, yeah, as your legal advisor. For professionals who can do that, yeah, the prime minister has said, um, if, if you can work from home, you should. And, and, and that is the best way to ensure the health and safety of, 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 of your staff. Um, if you are required to go into the office, then um, you know, employers must ensure that public health guidance um, is followed. And, and, and that okay. is avoiding meetings where possible, and making sure social distancing is taken place within the office. Um, ensuring hygiene standards are of an exceptional level. These are all obvious comments that, 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 government, that governments are talking about. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think that's easy for the, the, for the professionals, yeah, as I mentioned. Yeah, um, absolutely. For, for, for the contractors or the, the consultants who are going on site, um, and, and, you know, I, think we, I think we spoke a week or two back and you were... Uh, just returned from 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 from, from a visit. Mm -hmm. um, it, it is absolutely vital again that employers ensure that public health guidance is being followed, that the construction leadership council's site op operating procedures are, are being followed. And and if there's any doubt, any doubt that they are not, then I I think the employers, the senior managers need to make a, a, a very difficult but right decision and, and, and stop and prevent their staff from, from, from being in a situation where they, where they are at risk of, of, of contracting, uh, contracting the virus. Sure. And, it, and it, it requires um, some difficult decisions because at the end of the day, you, there are projects to deliver, there are contracts to perform, but health and safety must come first yeah, absolutely. and I, I think contractors and employers are in a much much better position now than they were on the 23rd of March when uh, the Prime Minister's announcement for lockdown was made followed by the tweet I, I mentioned earlier mm -hmm. um, you know they've taken a step back they have looked at ways of delivering the projects differently so that they can comply with the social distance rules, the construction leadership council's guidance. And for example, you know, we've all seen on social media, uh, kitchens having chairs removed around tables so that only two people can, can sit around a table, site meetings where people are standing uh, meters apart uh, from each other. And certain work that does require um, close contact um, you know, at the current time, if possible, not, not, not taking place. So, so I, think, I think by and large that, that, sh that should be happening um, on the, and I hope on the majority, the majority of, of construction sites. Um, there are clear guidance by Public Health and the Construction Leadership Council that, 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 that should be followed. Okay. 
All right. No, it's good. And, and again, for listeners, I mean, this, I think, I think what we all understand right now, just as you've already pointed out, Will, that, you know, where we are today as we record this podcast versus where we were back on the 23rd of March, and, and quite frankly, where we probably will be at the end of the month of April of 2020, are going to be in different locations as, as all of us, um, you know, as the governments understand how to approach it um, and how industry puts out its guidance to it. So I just would, you know, caution listeners to, you know, stay up to stay up to date on the current yes. information that's coming out. Um, and, and just like you said, I mean, from my own professional background, um, you know, people first. So there's always a need to make sure that you're, that you're looking at your staff and ensuring that the staff's health and safety uh, is paramount as you, as you walk through this. Now, of course, um, there could be situations and, and, and I'm going to kind of move things maybe a little bit from talking about impact on the construction market to let's start talking a little bit about maybe potential impacts on, on contracts because you've already yes. brought this yes. up that even though we're in this different arena where we're having, um, you know, kind of the friction of the friction of reality playing into this with, you know, not being able to do meetings in the same location. And, and although we have technology, sometimes that, that creates additional uh, time impacts that, that can knock on into the work that we're actually doing in delivering projects. Um, I think, you know, everybody listening to this understands and knows what force majeure is. Uh, but, but what happens if, for you found yourself on the 23rd of March in a contract that didn't have that kind of a clause. I'm kind of curious to hear what you, you know, what avenues might exist for an, for an engineering consultancy to, to deal with that situation that they're in. Yeah. You know, what, what are the legal ramifications of that? Yeah. So th there's clearly consequences. There's um, inability to deliver um, services um, and works. Um, there's there's going to be delay. Uh, there's there's going to be cost cost overruns, and you know the the obvious reasons for for for, for those consequences could be unable to perform um, be, because of a, a a threat to health and safety. Um, new site operating procedures are resulting in additional cost, additional time in in in, in delivery. Um, late and late delivery of supplies um, due to poor, poor transport at, um, connections, but also um, warehouses uh, are closing or a huge demand in, in, in other areas, such as for the NHS. So, so one has to has to look at their contract to ascertain what relief they have, and, and that is absolutely important. It's important because under English law, there isn't a concept of force majeure. Hmm. That the common law outside of the contract does not imply force majeure into, in, in, into your contract. So you are unable to rely on force majeure unless it's written in your contract and describes what force majeure is. And you know, some contracts might just say force majeure, um, which in itself creates some uncertainty because it is not a recognized term. It's, it, yeah. it, it, it's French and it's written into their, into their civil code and used elsewhere. Um, but the, the definition, if it is in your contract, would typically say that if there is a circumstance that neither party could prevent and which was outside of their reasonable control or contemplation, then they would obtain relief in the performance of, of, of their duties um, and an extension of time if, if, if your services are bound by, by time, time um, requirements. So for a professional, the first step because of COVID-19 is to pick up your contract and, and see if you have a force majeure clause. Um, most bespoke contracts will have it, I think, these days. A lot of the standard form contracts um, will, 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 will have it. And, and, and if there is a force majeure clause in there, it is likely that you are relieved from your, from your obligations because of, because of the virus. It's unlikely that you are going to be able to claim additional money okay. 
um, but you are uh, likely to be to, to obtain relief from delivery um, and, and an extension of time in, 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 this, in, in the circumstance. But, but, but it's not just the force majeure clause that one should focus on. There has been a huge amount of uh, chatter on social media, um, articles written by uh, external lawyers, uh, law firms on force majeure. It, that is only part of the yeah, part of the contract that needs to be looked at. Um, yeah, professionals you know, need to look at whether they're entitled to additional fees because of additional work, because of delay, uh, and and hopefully the variation provisions will will entitle them to claim additional fees in these circumstances. Um, and they also should be looking at an extension of time clause as well to see if they can obtain an extension of time as well as additional fees because of COVID-19. And most bespoke forms will allow that. Every contract's different, but, but most, most should. And, and, and certainly the, the standard industry forms such as you know, FIDIC um, and, and the ACE, um, the UK Consultant Engineer mm -hmm. standard form, yeah, that will entitle you to time and money. Okay. All right. Um, so, so, so everyone's talking about force majeure and yep. yeah, we, in, certainly in the UK, need to be very careful because it's not implied in, into the contract. So you need to pick up your contract and, and look what avenues you've got in, in the circumstances. Okay. All right. Very important. And I'm, you know, for the, for by the time most of the people that are listening to this, if they're in contracts, uh, I would I would have hoped that they've already gone through and done this. But certainly, if you haven't, it's it's something that needs to be needs to be looked after. You know, kind of in the same vein. Um, you know, as we look at as we look at whatever the new normal is going to be once we're you know moved beyond the current situation we're in right now. Do you see changes coming to standard form contracts or maybe even non-standard form contracts is specifically related to these types of situations with the thought process that now that we've experienced it, it's likely to happen again? Yeah, yeah, ab absolutely. I mean, it's not just about it's likely to happen again. Yeah, unfortunately, um, yeah, research, the, the, the press are saying this, the, the current circumstances are going to go on for for an, an extended period, how long we, you know, we, we, we don't know. So if, if you are negotiating a contract now, or you haven't signed yet, um, I, I think it is vital that you include um, a clause or series of clauses providing you with remedies in, 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 the, in, the, current, in the current circumstances. So yeah, that would, the three, buckets, I suppose, that I, I just mentioned, drafting in relation to force majeure, explaining what force majeure is, explaining that you get relief, bucket one. Bucket two, an extension of time because of, of, of COVID-19 and additional cost because of COVID-19. The, the way I tend, I've tended to describe the, the circumstance is an epidemic, a pandemic, including coronavirus, COVID-19, but also the immediate effects thereafter, because it might be declared by the World Health Organization that it is no longer a pandemic, but the consequences of may still exist, that it is still, it's difficult to get onto site. Social distance, distancing may be operated in, 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 in your jurisdiction. Yeah after the after the event um, there may be time and delay to get back on to site or when you need to restart your services mm -hmm. after the pandemic so it's important that it's widely defined i also think that um, all engineers should be looking at their standard terms of business their, their day one terms uh, their standard um, consultancy fee proposal that attaches terms. They should be looking at that and make and amending them so that they, they deal with the circumstances, the three buckets that I've, that, that, that I've just mentioned. Um, and moving forward, I think it's one of those areas that needs to go into the, the must-haves 
the, you know, the red flags, if I was carrying out the contract review, there isn't relief because of coronavirus, COVID-19. It, it, it's one of those important clauses now that must be, must be included in, in, in all appointments. And thus far, the market has um, reacted to that. And um, when I've been advising professionals, engineers on that clause, that there generally hasn't been that much kickback by, by the employers. It, I mean, it'd be wrong for them to, to do that. So we are getting those, those clauses in. If there is going to be a debate, it's whether the consultant gets money in addition to the, the, the relief forming obligations and the, and the delay. And um, yeah, that, is, that is an area that is debated um, in, 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 in negotiations. But most of the time, it is time and money. Yeah, okay. No, that's very good. And, and I like the way that you've been that into the you know, three, different, three different buckets. Um, you know, for those that are listening, the, the, the beauty of the podcast is you can hit rewind and go back. And that may be, I think, really an important segment of this show is talking around that because especially in the consultancy arena, um, if, if we're already in flight on a, on a contract, you know, the terms and conditions have already been placed in, you've built up your fee proposal was based off of a certain reality that now has changed. Um, I, I know just recently, in fact, as, as we record this, I'm in the, in the midst of a couple of different uh, proposal developments that are going on that, um, you know, the, the requests, you know, the, the request for proposal invitations of tender did not have any, anything, any language related to COVID-19. Mm -hmm. uh, there's been no amendments that have been sent out. Um, and so as we're developing, you know, our proposals and looking at the terms and conditions, this has now become very forefront is to, okay, you know, we are going to have to be very clear in assumptions and exclusions as we develop this um, in, our, in our tender responses and our, our proposal submittals so that it's clearly, clearly understandable to the client, to the employer that we haven't priced or established anything yeah. COVID in, in the stipulate, you know, that, that's a big assumption, I think, as we know now um, that, that potentially we could be operating in this, you know, kind of this new situation that we find ourselves mm. in some, some semblance of that for, for months to come, uh, certainly for months to come. So uh, again, I think for, for all of our listeners on here, very important um, to understand your contract terms and conditions, get into that. Uh, and then considering how that's going to how that's going to knock on into proposal development that's going uh, that you're maybe working on right now today, or that you're going to be looking at having to work on in the uh, yeah. you know, the, the incoming upcoming futures. Can um, I add one other? Yeah, I please. Add one other thing which is important, so particularly with international projects, and, I, and I've seen this a lot in the last week or so, is it, with professionals who who are on site, uh, you know, abroad outside of their their home com country. Um, where there are expats um, yeah, in Africa, yeah, in the Middle East, where there has been or will be shortly, um, particularly Africa, because it's, it's, as of today, it's, it's behind the curve. Um, the, the decision from the business is to get their staff home. Uh, yeah. um, and um, that, that's fine. Um, uh, yeah, in theory, uh, provided also one can get around the logistical issues of, with air travel. But, but, but in relation to the contract, most contracts that I've seen do not deal with the associated costs um, and consequences arising out of that. So you know, the, the consultant might be entitled to an extension of time. Um, if, 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 if lucky, it, it might be entitled to additional fees, but, but does that include extracting its staff at huge expense? Who takes that risk? Who, who, um, yeah, who prices for that? Yeah, it's also a, yeah, a difficult assessment when you look at, um, you know, take Africa, for example, in many parts of Africa, um, either the COVID-19 cases are very low, and in some in some countries, um, it, there hasn't been many, if any, reported. Um, at that point in time, the local markets aren't operating social distancing or isolation or 
or, or leaving towns and cities. So why should the international consultant who is uh, you know, working, working there, why, why adopt a different approach? And, and I raise this because of, I expect you know, a large number of listeners are, are, are across the globe working to also think about how that's going to be drafted, how that's going to be priced for. It, 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 it's probably right now to, to make, uh, you know, make provisions or drafting in, in contracts dealing with that exact circumstance. So in the fee schedule, provide um, a statement to say, if as a result of a force majeure or, or coronavirus, COVID-19, um, it is decided that, we, that staff need to leave yeah, the country, this is the consequence. This is the this is this is what's going to happen with the fees, and it's a new area of negotiation because yeah, no, it, you're right. But it, it's definitely something that needs to be needs to be considered. Yeah, no, it, that's actually a really good a really good point, Will. And it may also it may also knock on into the into your into your company and how it sets up um, a different different type of insurance arrangements as well for for expat staff. Um, yes, because you know, there's there's certainly companies out there that that specialize in extraction of people for health issues or whatever it may be, um, and, and so that may be an entire new area of having to look at how do you certainly on the, on international jobs where you have expats that are that are physically there. What are the what are the parameters and the in the kind of the response plans that you have in place to get them out? Um, in addition to what are the contractual, what are the, you know how that's going to play out in the contractual terms and conditions? So very really really good point. A um, couple more couple more questions. Yes. This is this is really fascinating. It's a, I really appreciate your time on this. Um, we, we've talked a lot about now about um, you know the force majeure, um, the, you know, the three yes. different buckets and the kind of the buckets of, of approach uh, on as, as we move towards that. Um, this may be linked to what we've already talked about, but I'm just going to, I'm going to ask it straight out again, because yes. we have, we've talked around it, but haven't really just nailed it. What, what should, what should someone do if the site that they're working on turns up closed? So the employer or the client just says, that's it, we're closing the site. Um, you know, off you go. What are there, you know, have we already kind of talked through that or do you think that there's some additional, additional considerations that need to be taken into in that kind of a situation? But so, so the first, the first point, and we, you know, I probably should have mentioned this earlier, is dialogue and obvious comments is that is absolutely key. We're seeing where there has been closure, um, almost the contract being uh, left in the drawer, and 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 almost a, a gentleman's agreement amongst the the professionals, um, the contractor about what's going to happen. It, it stay away. Um, some commitment from the employer that we'll, we'll, we'll look at restarting this as soon as possible. We'll look at your costs. We'll look at, look at time and money. Um, and, and to a large extent, yeah, yeah, that's a positive dialogue is, 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 is absolutely key. Um, and, and if there are any, 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 any discussions around that, make sure again, another obvious comment, you document these yeah. discussions. So, yeah. And yeah, as, as a lawyer, the amount of times that the problems come to us, and there's very little um, e yeah, evidence, hard evidence of uh, um, you know, meeting notes, telephone uh, notes to document what has been what has been agreed or promised, so that you can hopefully re rely on that moving forward. Um, but you you must go to your contract, um, and you need to follow the mechanisms thereunder. So that might include a notice. And it's obvious, but the, the project is going to be in delay now. I'm going to incur additional fees. I'm not going to meet um, the key dates in my contract. So here is a notice setting out the consequences. And you, you are right to provide those notices in order, to, in order to protect your position. The majority of contracts will give you relief in, in, those, in those circumstances. Relief in terms of performance, relief in terms of program obligations, but they also are likely to, as I've said, give you additional cost. But pick up the contract, file the correct notices. That, that might be a warning notice, that, that might be a notice within a certain time scale in order to claim 
additional time and, and, and additional money. It's vital that you, you comply with those notices because if you don't, it is possible you'll lose any entitlement or end up in a, a scrap further down the line. Um, he said, she said, um, and, 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 the, and there is a vacuum as to um, the current position. Um, and that tends to lead to disputes which you want, which you want to avoid. So again, pick up the contract, follow your notices, provide your notices. Okay. All right. Well, thank you for that. Um, so I've got one last question here, and this is, I don't know that this is necessarily a completely out there question, but again, as we're starting to look at, you know, we are where we are now, things yes. are going to move on. We're going to get into a different, a different, a, a different type of new normal. Um, but do you see any kind of an impact? And, and if so, what is that impact going to be on the judicial and legal system, um, specifically with regards to construction cases, um, but yes. maybe just in general, are there, you know, are there going to be delays in this? Is it going to, is it going to take longer to resolve issues just because of where we're at? Yeah. So it's, it, it's early days, but even, even in a, in a short time scale since the lockdown, yeah, a, a fair amount has happened in terms of the, le the legal system. Um, we are all um, working from home, um, which means for, for disputes and, 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 and the dispute process, um, it is not as easy to convene um, pre-action protocol meetings, settlement meetings, mediation, and, and also clearly court hearings. Um, so a number of the cases that we have in the office have, have been, been delayed. Um, delayed because we're unable to, to meet to have a mediation. Um, the mediation might have happened at our offices, our offices are, are shut. So that needs to be rearranged and I'll come on, I'll come on to that in a minute. Um, unable to file documents as part of the dispute process mm -hmm. because they're on site, they're in the office and we're working, we're working from home. So, so there has been, there has been delay, clearly. But we are starting to see the legal, legal system become modern in its approach. And um, my firm has hosted a number of mediations, set of meetings already using Zoom um, with, with some success. Um, you need a good leader of that meeting, of that mediation in order to, to direct and also work the, the technology, which is a challenge, <laughs> yeah, challenge for exactly. some of us. Um, so, so technology is coming to the fore. Um, I'm aware of some hearings in front of a judge taking place um, yeah. using, using technology. So w w we're getting there. And, 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 and the general view is where there is an absolute need for a hearing, for a settlement meeting, it will still take place using technology. And, and I think over time, it will become near the new normal or, or near, okay. near, near to that. We have the technology to do it. What we're also seeing, and this is, this is important for, um, the, for, for consultants um, who um, might owe money or are in a, in a dispute, is adjudication taking more and more adjudications in the UK. So for those who are not aware of, of, of the adjudication process in, in the UK, it, it's a statutory process that all those involved in the construction sector have a right to. It's a fast track dispute resolution process within about 28 days from submission of, of your claim to a decision by an adjudicator. A lot of the hearings are uh, so a lot of the decisions are, are done without hearings and on paper and it's cheaper, it's fast track, it's sometimes a bit quick and dirty, but it's fantastic for payment matters. Mm -hmm. We are seeing an uptick in adjudications because the settlement meetings, the, you know, the hearings, the courts aren't taking place, but also some organisations are taking advantage of the current circumstance, knowing that it will be very difficult for 
a recipient of a claim in an adjudication to get their act together, find the documents and respond within 28 days. Mm, okay. And what is, what is also interesting is that there has already been a court case on this in the UK and generally the circumstances are not a defence. Um, you are likely to be able to get extensions of time if you plead that and, and you do it in a reasonable manner. However, however, it is not a defence. So what I say to, uh, to, to, to the listeners is make sure your house is in order. If, if there are any mm. matters that you think are uh, at risk, um, be, be ready and, and look out for that. Okay. All right. All right. Good. Good insight. Good insight. Well, thank you very much. This, uh, the main segment of the show is going to come to an end here, but th this has been really, really useful information. I appreciate it. And uh, Will's going to stick around for the uh, hot seat segment. We'll be right back. I hope you are enjoying this episode of the Civil Engineering Podcast, which is produced by the Engineering Management Institute. Please be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel here for more podcast episodes and for all of our Engineering Manager 8020 Shorts videos that we publish weekly where we interview successful engineering managers. Now it's time to jump into our Civil Engineering Hot Seat segment. So we're back and it's now time for the CE hot seat segment with Will Buckby. Will, let's get, let's get into this. We're going to get going right okay. away. Yeah. First question at you is, um, is uh, a lot of people have rituals that they practice each day. These, these may be mm -hmm. things like, um, you know, going to the gym in the morning, going for a, for a walk, um, you know, could be, could be reading a book, something like that that they do every day. And they do that because they see that as a way of being able to keep them, keep the, keep the saw sharp. Uh, and to be you know, professionally and, and, and personally um, uh, benefited from that. So I'd be curious to hear, do you have any rituals that you follow each day? Yes. So um, yeah, as, as a lawyer, um, I'm, I'm fortunate to be, uh, to, to, to be busy um, and um, you know, the, the, the hours tend to be quite lengthy at times. But I think for me, what's really important is in the morning, I... I ensure that I, I spend time before I leave the office with, with my two children um, in, you know, in order to, 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 to keep sane and, but also spend time with them and, and the, watch them, watch them grow up. And that, that is, that, that starts my, that starts my day off. Um, in, in the current, uh, current climate, uh, walking, uh, <laughs> yeah. which I expect what everyone else is doing, but um, um, I, I make sure towards the end of the day, uh, in addition to, uh, to chasing my, my two children around in the morning, um, I, I, will, I will do a long walk before, before sundown in, in order to, to escape the, the, the intensity of the, of the day and also to escape the children. But um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Just a, a nice, a nice uh, counter ritual to the first one in the morning. So, so that's, that's, that's awesome. Awesome. Well, we're kind of along in the same vein um, for, uh, you know, for personal and professional development. I'd be curious to know if there's, you know, obviously right behind you, there's lots of books. Uh, we talked about that just before the, before the podcast today. Uh, but I'd be curious to know, is there one, one, maybe even two books that, uh, that you would, you would find that you would recommend uh, to others to read, or maybe that you even give as a gift, you know, two books that have had a really large impact yeah. on you uh, personally or professionally. Okay, so um, professionally, uh, w without a doubt, has to be uh, a book called Professional Services Agreements by Rachel Barnes, who uh, is a retired partner of, 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 of Beal & Co. And uh, that book um, deals with the nuts and bolts of professional services agreements. Um, and it is described in a way that isn't over, over legalistic. It's very commercial. And very practical. Um, so, at the the start of my career or my my, my early days of Beetle Co, that was my Bible, and it is still on my my desk in the office. Hmm. And I turn to it 
um, I, I turn to it very regularly. So I, I would recommend that to anyone with either an interest in you know, the legal aspects of consultancy agreements or for, as a resource for when you're negotiating an appointment and you need, uh, you need some guidance, you need a steer. Um, I, I should add, and I, I haven't chosen this book for this session for this reason, but I'm updating that, that text oh, um, okay. currently. So it is brought um, to the, the current, current day to affect legal developments um, you know, with the likes of BIM and the hardening contractual market, perhaps some drafting in relation to coronavirus or COVID-19. Yeah, good um, but, but but that has been that yeah that that has been my comfort blanket for um yeah for for, for many years. So professionally, uh, Rachel Barnes's uh, book on professional services agreements. Um, um, personally, um, I, um, I I'm a fan, um, and many people aren't, of Richard Branson, um, and I enjoy reading his short, uh, his short books, and also. Um, his, his sticker hardbacks, um, just on his business decisions, just on um, the exciting um, adventures that 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 has been been on. Um, because I I, you know, I enjoy his entrepreneurialism and his excitement about life. And the legal profession at the at the end of the day is still a business. Yeah. Um, and um, I get lots of personal and professional. Um, I wouldn't say ideas, but um, drivers from, from 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 Richard Branson. Uh, so I'm yeah I'm currently reading uh, reading one of his books. Okay, that's fabulous. In fact, I think I'm gonna want to make notes on the uh, on the professional services contract. That may be a book that I'm gonna be buying here shortly, or maybe I should wait for you to get the edits done on the uh, next version. So. <laughs> That's fabulous. All right, I've got one one more question for you. Okay. And we we call it the uh, civil engineering career elevator advice question. So, mm -hmm. if you got into an elevator with a with an engineer, of course, maintaining social distancing and all that, uh, all course. those aspects, of course, with it. Um, but you had thirty to forty seconds to give that uh, to give that person some advice, career advice. Um, what would that career advice be? Well. As a lawyer, I'd I'd have to have a legal 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 slant legal Actually. slant on it. But um, I, I would I would say um, don't leave the contract in the in the drawer. Um, yeah, it's negotiated, it's prepared, it's signed for a reason. And so so if you are if you are at the forefront of a project and and and, and delivering services, um, perhaps. Um, yeah, on a big ticket project or whatever, is, is make sure that you, that you at least understand understand your contract. Two examples I, I, I give, give regularly around payment. Um, make sure you know your payment process. Um, make sure you know when you need to submit invoices and, and in what format, because cash is key, particularly in the current, the current climate. Make sure you know your variation process put your correct notices in use your contract it's there for a reason um, and, and and those who operate their contract most of the time are better off um, so that, that that that's that's my my advice my career my career advice don't leave the contract in the door that's that's great advice will i appreciate that very much um, thanks a lot for uh, joining me today. I really, really appreciate it. Again, this has been great information. Uh, and looking forward to getting this out and, uh, and, and letting the listeners be able to get their uh, get their ears on it. Um, just one final one final note here is um, you know where can anyone that's been listening today where where can they get in contact with you and learn more about uh, the work that you do with Beal Co. Okay, so um, Beal Co. We, uh, we have offices in the UK, London, Bristol, Ireland. Um, and the Middle East, um, but they, they can get in contact with me. Um, my, my email address is w.buckby, B-U-C-K-B-Y, at beale, B-E-A-L-E, -E, hyphen, law.com. Okay, 
Wonderful, wonderful. And we'll have we'll have um, all those details in the show notes for today's show uh, for today's show, ladies and gentlemen. So you can uh, get you can get your uh, hands on that information. Will, thank you very much again. Um, stay safe. All the best to you and your family. And uh, we'll be back in touch again real soon. I'm sure. The same to you. Thank you very much. So that was a really good conversation that I just uh, completed there with uh, Will Buckby. Hope you enjoyed it um, and got some really key. Uh, items for you to take away with regards to the projects and the contracts that you have underway and the ones that you're going to be developing and putting in place in the months and years ahead. Uh, again, great, great points. And if you want to get all the uh, show notes, uh, links to some of the books and uh, the other references that will brought up during the, uh, during the course of the interview today, please go over to civilengineeringpodcast.com. Look for episode 143 and you'll find all the different details for today's show as well as go there and you can get access to all the other uh, shows that we've got in the library there, along with the details that, uh, that can come up with all that. So I really hope you enjoyed it again today. Look forward to being with you on a uh, podcast here in the future. And until then, I wish you all the best in your civil engineering endeavors. <laughs>